Father, we thank you so much for the people of God. Thank you for the people who are going to hear what you're going to speak into our lives tonight. We thank you for your presence and we thank you so much for the worship that went up before you. And we ask you tonight, Lord, that you would you just speak to our hearts tonight. We need to hear a clear, defined word from you. And we know that you are with us, Lord. You promised never to leave us or forsake us. And you even told us where there are two or three gathered together in my name, you are in the midst of us. So we thank you for being in the midst of us. So as we get into the word of God, we thank you for giving us unction in the Holy Spirit that we may speak by your measure of grace given unto me. And I ask you, Father, to open the ears of the hearers and the viewers tonight, Lord. Just open our ears so that we can hear exactly what you're saying to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you so much that when everything is said and done, you and you alone will get all the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And God, we thank you. Now, the last time I ministered uh, on, the, on, a, on Thursday night worship service, I talked about uh, the subject entitled The Power of the Cross. And I didn't get to finish uh, that message, and so I thought it would be fitting and appropriate to just go ahead and finish uh, the rest of the story because there is more that I could have shared, but the time didn't permit. And so tonight, I just want to pick up where I left off at. And if you don't mind, I'm not going to take a time to take the time to go back and do a moment of passing and review because that would take up a lot of the time and I don't want to take away from what I'm going to be discussing with you tonight. So if you don't mind, you can go back into the archives and you can look and see uh, that message that I talked about. And you, if you haven't seen the first part, go and look at it because that'll give you more understanding of uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight. But in the meantime, just stay with us and, and hear what the Word of God has, ha has to say. And so tonight our subtitle will be Crucified with Christ. So we're talking about the power of his cross, crucified with Christ. Now I was looking at a video yesterday and um, it's by um, a minister called Zach Poon. And, um, and he was talking, uh, he made a statement and I wanted to share that statement that he made. He said, the most repeated statement of Jesus is in Matthew chapter 16, verse number 24 and 25. And um, I, I kind of like, you know what? Uh, I gotta check this out and just wanna fact check this to see if this is so. And so I'm going to let you be the judge because you're going to hear something that you constantly hear Jesus say in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's gospel. And Paul even picks it up in his narratives as well. So let's get into it and find out what Jesus has to say to us in Mark chapter 6, Matthew, I'm sorry, chapter 16, verse number 24 and 25. Now listen to what it says. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it or will find it. Once again, that last scripture 25 says, whosoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so that's what we're talking about tonight, the power of his cross crucified with Christ. Now, the Bible talks about losing our life for the sake of Christ. That is not an easy thing to do because we got to understand that in order for us to live the life of Christ, and we shared this with you the last um, time we shared uh, this message, we talked about how to be, to be saved is free. Salvation comes to us free. You didn't have to do anything as far as to procure salvation for yourself, but to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. However, to become a disciple of Christ, it's going to cost you something. In fact, it's going to cost you everything. I'll go further than that. It's going to cost you your life. So therefore, Jesus explains that in the scripture. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 10, verse number 37. All right, you're there. 10 and 37 says this. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Wow, 
Listen to what Jesus, he's telling us that you got to love me more than you love your family members. And so it's no marvel because God said in his word, he tells us in the, in the commandments, he said, the first commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. And then he said, the second is like unto the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. So God is putting, he's putting himself above everyone. And it shouldn't be any marvel to us because he's the supreme creator. He's the supreme being. He's the one who created us. We didn't create ourselves. We didn't will ourselves to be here. You are living in this earth because God's will is for you to be here. You didn't decide a day you were going to be born. You didn't decide who your parents were going to be. You didn't decide the date that you were going to be born, the color of your skin. You didn't decide your height. <laughs> Amen. You, didn't, you, you might have decided your weight, but not your <laughs> height. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so, you know, some things we find in the Word of God that God is responsible for. He and Him alone. And so, therefore, if He is the Creator, shouldn't we give Him the reverence that is due unto Him to love Him first and foremost above everyone else? Sure we should. Now, He's saying to us, now notice He said love. We ought to love Every, him more than we love anything else and everyone else. And so therefore, our devotion to Jesus must come above even our own household. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Listen to something that a man said to Jesus one day. He said, Master, I'll follow you, but let me go and bury my father first, and then I will come and follow you. Now, now what the man was not saying, it was not saying that, that the man's father just died and he had to go and funeralize him. No, that's, get that out of your mind. That's not what happened. He's saying to, his, saying to Jesus, listen, wait until my dad, my father's died and I get the inheritance. And then after that, I will take up my cross and follow you. And Jesus said, remember the statement he said? He said, let the dead bury the dead. It may sound like an insensitive statement, but he's saying this is the cost to be a disciple of me. Let the dead bury, your, bury the dead and you take up your cross and follow me. Or you come and follow me and you go preach the gospel, preach the kingdom of God. So this is what Jesus is requiring of someone who will to be a disciple of him. Come on, folks. This is what the scripture says. This is the words of Jesus. And many of us, we've not made that step yet. Yes, we may have, may have come to the altar and said, you know, Lord Jesus, you know, come into my life, save me. I believe with all my heart that you've been raised from the dead. I confess you with my mouth or whatever. But we've, we stop there and that's it. We join the church. We write our name on the roll or whatever. And from that point on, we just say, okay, well, I'm going, I'm going to heaven. I'm enjoying the trip. I'm going to be saved. I just serve in the choir, serve in the usher board, serve in the deacon board, do all of these things that we do in church. However, Jesus requires more than that because once he's got you to be born again, he wants you to come and be a disciple. That means you have got to follow him where he goes. Listen, it was him who made the call to get you saved. Remember, Peter, James, John, all of the disciples, he called them. He called them. Those disciples in, 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 in Jewish days, the, the, the disciples chooses their master. But here it is. The master is choosing the disciples. That's why Jesus said, you have not chosen me. I have chosen you. You understand? So therefore, we got to understand that when Jesus said, you got to follow me at all costs, that means that if you have to lose the inheritance, many people in that day, because they did not believe that Jesus who was, was who he said he was, you know what they did? Uh, uh, if you said that, I believe Jesus is Lord, they put you out of the synagogue. Your family would, would just disown you. They would, they would bury you. They would have a funeral and bury you. Say, my son is dead, even though you're alive and standing right in front of their face. Because they're saying, we disown you. All the blessings that we had, all the inheritance that we had, we're not giving it to you now. We're going to give it to your little brother because you have disowned this family when you decided you're going to follow you. Jesus is saying, this is the cost of discipleship. And one of the things that we're not ready to do, we're not ready to receive the persecution and suffer the persecution that we are going to receive as a result of calling Jesus Lord. He is Savior, but he wants to go beyond that. He wants to be your Lord. Now, let me show you something in the scripture here again. Uh, the Bible says, and Paul, Paul says in Gal Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20. All right. I, I, forget, I keep forgetting that I, I, I don't have to look at my Bible here. I just love my Bible. I just, just love my Bible so much that I want to just <laughs> amen, look at it all the time. But notice what it says. I have been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He says, I am crucified with Christ. And it is not I that lives, but Christ is living in me. Why? Because that old guy, that fleshly guy, he died. And when he died, he gave Christ all of the powers, all of the authority, all of the rights to own my life. So therefore, when, when Christ requires something of me, it should not be a hard thing for me to do simply because I am his. The Bible talks about we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. And therefore, we ought to glorify God in our spirit and our body. Why? Because it belongs to God. Nothing we have belongs to us. I don't care what you say. Nothing belongs to us. Even this body that you have, it's not yours. Listen, you didn't bring it into this world. You didn't create it. <laughs> it's not yours. It's borrowed. God gave you this body. That's why we ought to take care of these things. Because it's the only one you get. You follow what I'm saying? And so God gave us this body for, so, for us to glorify him with this and our spirit because they belong to God. So therefore, Paul is saying, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live in this flesh, in this physical body, I live by what? By faith. The just shall live by what? By faith. I have to trust God to maintain me. I have to trust God to maintain my, 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 my body and my spirit, my soul, everything. My family members, my, everything that I do, I have to trust God. I live by faith. And when we say we live by faith, some people think that it means just quitting the job and just, you know, no, 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 no. Every day, everything, everything we do, we do by faith in Christ Jesus. We consult him because he comes first. That means we're not going to go out and we're going to take a career that does not it coincide with God's purpose and will for our lives. It means that we're not going to go and just marry who we desire because we, we think she's fine, we think she's cute. We might be in love with her, but that might not be God's desire for you. Why? Because we belong to him. We are bought with the price, folks. The life that I live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Come on, saints. You ought to see that. No cross, no crown. I'm going to say it again. No cross, no crown. Why is this so important? Let's look at it in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 11 and 12. For this is a faithful saying. If we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, King James says suffer. If we shall also reign with him, if we deny him, he also will deny us. Notice what the Bible tells us. He tells us in the word of God that if we suffer with him, we will reign with him. Many people want a cross. I said, I want a crown rather. I said that the last time. But they don't want to do what it takes. They don't want to suffer. They don't want to endure anything. But then they think, I'm going to wear a crown. Praise the Lord. I'm going to, go, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to get my crown. I'm going to sit, sit right, right down. I'm going to run on this race. I fought a good fight and kept the faith. Come on, folks. What have you done for the kingdom of God? What have you done for the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, if you've not died to self, you will not get the crown because self wants to do what self wants to do. Self wants to, wants to go where self wants to go. When we should be reading our Bible, self wants to sit down and watch a movie. When we should be fasting, self wants to feast. You understand what I'm saying? Self wants to look good in, in the front of everybody else. So therefore, if we will not suffer with God or suffer with Christ, how shall we reign with him? Amen? Now, notice in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We're going to get to the cup of suffering in just a few minutes. In Romans chapter 6, the Bible says, oh, I said, yeah, let's look at Romans chapter 8. That's right, Romans chapter 8. But we are going to come to Romans chapter 6. I'm giving you a heads up right now, okay? Romans chapter 8, the Bible says in verse number 16. Notice what he says now. The, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And of children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we might also be glorified together. Notice. 
Everybody wants to be glorified, but nobody wants to suffer. Verse 18 says, For I I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So therefore, he's saying the sufferings that we're going through, and I'm not talking about suffering because you lost your job because, you know, uh, uh, you you go to church on Sunday and you wanted to... (laughs) You know, you wanted the boss to give you off every Sunday and you, you know, you start taking Sundays off and things like that. I'm not talking about that kind of suffering. I'm talking about the suffering of persecution. Suffering unjustly for the cause and the sake of Christ. You know, so what we got to understand is that there's something that's called a cup of suffering. We're going to discuss that in just a minute. And and LaRue, if you don't mind, turn to Romans chapter 6, verse number 5. Now, notice what the Bible says, Romans chapter 6, verse number 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, King James said destroyed, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Next verse says this, for if we died with Christ, notice this, if we died with him, if we got on that cross with him, we believe that we shall live with him. So let's take the reciprocal of that. If we don't die with him on that cross, what's, what's going to happen? We will not live with him. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. So, folks, once again, no cross, no crown. If you're not willing to suffer with him, you're not going to be glorified together with him. Notice, if we deny him, he will deny us. But if we are faithful to him, He remains faithful and cannot deny himself. Amen? Because we are one with him. Glory be to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now listen to this. Listen to this. We got to move on. We got to move on because I want you to understand. Why are you talking about death so much? Listen. Here is what happened. Um, The Bible says in John chapter 12. Let's go there first. And I'll bring bring it to this point that I'm trying to make. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life, notice he's saying it again. John is recording what he's saying, will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now he's talking about falling to the ground and dying, a corner wheat, falling to the ground and dying, it abides alone. If you leave it in the, in the storehouse, it just will be seed in the storehouse. If you leave it in your pocket, it'll be seed in the pocket. But except the corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, notice death must take place first. It abides alone. And let me tell you something. When you decide to die for the sake of Christ, you're going to be alone. You're going to be in that grave all by yourself. You will look for friends. They won't be there. Sometimes parents won't be there. Sometimes children don't understand and they won't be there. You'll be mocked, you'll be ridiculed, be scourged for the sake of Christ. But that's the price that we pay, the cost of discipleship. This is what what he desires. And folks, once again, if we love God more than we love anything else, we don't mind the persecution, even though it hurts, though it's painful. Now, why are you talking about this? Why are you talking about, uh, you know, the sufferings and death and the crucified and all of this stuff like that? Because, folks, there is coming a time of great persecution among the church. It's coming. It's coming. And the thing about it is is that if you love your life, then you're going to try to save it. And if you don't love your life in this world, guess what? You don't mind the persecution to come. Why? Because Kenneth died to to himself a long time ago. I've died to my desires. Hello. Glory to God. I got to keep going. I got to keep going because I can get bogged down in that one. He says, but if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. We are only able to bring fruit 
to the degree that we are willing or able to die to self. And that is not easy, folks. That is not easy. That is not easy. Dying to self, selfishness. Dying to self-centeredness. Dying to self-righteousness. All these things. Why? Because we, we want to look good. You follow what I'm saying? We want, we, want, we want everybody to think well of us. But when you look to Christ, the Bible says he was despised and rejected of men. A man acquainted with sorrows and full of grief. We got to understand, the cross crucifies the self-life. It's like putting him on the cross. I remember Robert Learden talking about years and years ago. He, um, he went, when he got out of high school, he wanted to be a basketball player. And he did really good in basketball, but he said that, you know, that, that the Lord came to him one time and showed him a vision. And in this vision, he saw a casket. And the Lord told him to go and look at the man in the casket. And so when he went and he looked at the man in the casket, he saw himself. And the Lord said to him, Roberts, you're the only one that can close that casket and bury it. Wow. He thought about it. And he said, well, Lord, I want to play basketball. I want to get married. I want to have kids. You know, I want to have, I want to do all these. He said, Roberts, only thing you can do, you're the only one that can close this casket and bury it. So he wanted to do ministry, but he wanted to do everything else. But what did God call him to do? Called him to a higher life because God had a plan and a purpose for his life. But folks, when God has a plan and a purpose for your life, guess what? Your ways, your life, and God's life are going to clash because what you want to do and what God wants you to do is going to clash. Yes, even people who are going to go into ministry because they want to feel that, well, I want to go and preach to the world. Well, maybe that's not what God wants you to do. Why? Because when you have the mic, you look, you, you're on, everybody's looking at you. You know, you're on stage. People will speak well of you. They will praise you. You know, a lot of ministers right now, Hollywood stars, you know, people are praising them, you know, and, and they got likes and millions of likes and everything like that. And they keep putting things on Facebook, Facebook and TikTok and all these things like that because they want people to follow them. They want people to see them. What is it with all these new uh, Instagram and Snapchat photos that ministers are, 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 are putting on there and they look like Hollywood celebrities and people just like, like, like. But when you take up the cross, guess what? People are going to hate you. They're going to put hate speech on your, 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 your comments. They're not going to like what you say. The Bible says, woe unto you when all men speak well of you. And there's too many of us that's looking for the praise and the applaud of men and not the approval that comes from God. When you get the approval of God, people are not going to like you. Why are we trying to get the world to like us? We're supposed to be different. The scripture tells us, and I sound like I'm fussing, but I'm not. The scripture tells us that we are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a, 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 a peculiar people, a holy nation. That means we're set apart. We're different. We're not strange. We're strange to them, but we're not strange. We're love. We're the purchased people of God, and they're not going to like you. Wow. Paul said this. It's the cross that crucifies me. I have to die to me. Every day I live, I got to die to Kenneth. I got to die to my own desires, my own will. When we see the heinousness, I spell, I pronounced that wrong, the heinousness, that's what it is. The decay and the deadly effects of sin. We cry out to be delivered from this wretchedness. Paul says in Romans chapter seven, verse number 24, he says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? One of the cruelties of the Romans during that day is a man murdered someone. What he would do, he would take the murdered man and strap it on the back of the man who killed him. Think about it. So he's got to walk around with a dead man on his back, walking around. Everyone sees. What about the decay, the putrid smell? Oh my God, that's got to be horrendous. But guess what? He had to, that's his, that's his cross. He's got to take that on his back. And so as that man began to decay, guess what? 
all his decaying flesh is decaying the live man flesh. Paul said, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Some of us, we're still carrying the stink dead man, the man that died on, that should have died. We're still carrying him around on our back. And we're laughing, we're attending church and we're doing all these great and wonderful things. But yet we got a dead man on our back. And as a result, if we don't get rid of that dead man, all of the decay is going to get on us. And it's going to kill us little by little. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? Only Christ can. Only Jesus can deliver me from the body of this death. The cup of suffering is something that we all have got to face as Christians and believers in Christ Jesus. In Matthew 20, verse number 20 through 28, the Bible says, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons kneeling down and asking him something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm a, I am baptized with? And he said to them, we are able. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my father. Now notice the response. And when the 10 heard it, they were greatly displeased with their two brethren. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and those who are great exercise authority over them? Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Here it is. He brings it right back. He's telling these guys, you're going to have to die to your selfish ambition. You're going to have to desire, die to your desires. You're going to have to die to this thing of wanting to be great, want to be celebrated, and want to be popular. You've got to die to that. Because if you love your life, you'll lose it. But he said, but if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. Praise the Lord. Notice the cup of suffering. The Bible talks about this in Mark. Matthew chapter 26, we'll skip Mark because that's going to repeat what I've just talked about. Matthew 26 and 33, while Jesus was in the place called Gethsemane. The Bible says, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go over and pray, go pray over there. That's what it says. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup, what? Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Listen to me, brothers and sisters, saints of the living God. Jesus is asking the same question of his church today. And I'm not talking about, can you not watch with me? What is your response to the question that he asked about the disciples, James and John? Can you drink of the cup that I'm about to drink of? And you are, are you willing to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? 
And they answered and said, yes, they did. Listen to me, saints of God. Jesus wrestled with the same question in the Garden of Gethsemane, and his decision was, not my will, but thy will be done. When you get on that cross, that's what you're saying. Not my will, Lord, but thy will be done. Why did he do it? Why did he go to that cross? We know who he went to the cross for, but why did he go to that cross? He did nothing wrong. He did nothing deserving of death. But why did he go? The scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number two, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's why he did it. That's why he did it. For the joy that was set before him. What was the joy that was set before him? I believe in that cup he saw us. I believe he saw that in order to bring mankind into salvation, and deliverance from sin and from the decay of sin. He saw us in that cup and he endured. I came down to save men, not to destroy them. And so he endured, he stayed on the cross. We sang a song years ago, he could have come down from the cross to save himself, but he decided to die to save me and you, my friend. And in my closing, you know, I love songs. I love hymns and things like that. But before I tell you this song, I want to ask you a question. When you look at the cross, what do you see? When you look at the cross, what do you see? Donnie McClurkin penned a song saying, for the cross will always represent the love God has for me. When the Lord of glory, heaven sent, gave all on Calvary just for me. Just for me. Jesus came and did it just for me. So when I look at the cross, I have a new picture. I have a new outlook. I see love. When I look at the cross, I see love because you know what? It not only was the thing, the instrument that was used by the Romans to crucify our Lord, but it's the same thing that God uses to crucify me. And when he crucifies me, I can now walk in love because as long as I'm alive without Christ, I'll be selfish, self-centered, self-preserved, self-religious, and everything else, self-righteous included. But when I go on that cross like he did, it kills all the selfishness so that love can now come forth and abound. And now I can love. I'm not afraid to love. I'm not, a be, I'm a, I'm not afraid to be the least in the line. I'm not afraid to be despised and looked at with critical eyes. Now, you understand the power of the cross. The power of the cross to kill us so that love can reign in our hearts. Father, we thank you. We bless you for this word. I thank you so much for your people. I thank you so much for transformation taking place. Nobody wants to die. If we could, we all would want to live forever. And now the matter of the fact is, Lord, that we all will live forever. But the question is, where? Will we spend that time in eternity with you or will we spend that time in an eternal abyss? 
That's the question we must all ask ourselves. But you sent your son Jesus to die for us on that cross so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. I thank you so much for the cross of Christ. And I also thank you for this journey of taking me to my own cross. Because by it, selfishness, the me in me, or should I say the me, myself, and I are being put to death so that you can live in me. It is my prayer, Father, that everyone that hears the sound of my voice in this message will come to a place where they will once again revisit the cross. I said it before, I'll say it again. I remember Bobby King, Minister Bobby came up here and he said, make sure you got your wallet, make sure you got your keys, make sure you got your cell phone, but make sure you don't leave your cross. Because many times we face situations in life and in our everyday endeavors, we run into situations whereby the me in me rises up. That's not like you. So I'm asking you, Father, help us all to revisit the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> and if you're listening to this message today, you've not made that step towards the cross. There's room at the cross for you. Jesus is waiting right now with loving arms, open arms. He's already paid the price for your sin. The sin debt has been paid. The only thing it is for you to do, my friend, is to come to the cross and receive what he's already made available to you, to me, and to the whole entire world. The Bible says he's the propitiation for our sins and not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. So all you have to do, the Bible says, if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. But that's not the only step because you got to repent of your sins. You got to first acknowledge that you are a sinner. You got to second of all, believe that God will save you. Believe that he died for your sins on the cross and see, confess with your mouth that he is Lord and when I say he's Lord, I didn't say he is your savior. I say he is your Lord. That means what he says goes. That's where discipleship begins. The question still remains today, my friend. Are you willing to drink of the cup of suffering? Are you willing to be baptized with the baptism of death? Even though we didn't get a chance to talk about the baptism of death, still, the Lord is asking the question, you know, we talked about when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane facing all of the sufferings that he would have to endure for the salvation of mankind, for you and I, my friend, all of our loved ones, our relatives, our neighbor, everyone born of a woman in the planet. Jesus took the full punishment, the wrath of Almighty God on himself. Don't think for five minutes it was the Roman soldiers that put Jesus on that cross. Don't think it was the scribes, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees, the elders, the chief priests, and all of the people involved in that story. It wasn't them. The Bible tells us that Jesus was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. The Father himself, the Bible says in Isaiah 53, it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to put him to grief. Why? He did it for us all. It ought to be saved, you and I, had to be tried. Our sentence was guilty as charged, but Jesus came and took the full punishment of our sins. It is always the order of God that in order for the guilty to go free, someone innocent had to die. And that's what the lamb slain from the foundation of the world was all about. He came and died for our sins. And now today he's offering salvation to you and I. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do about the cross? Because when you and I stand before the judge of judges, the tribunals of tribunals, the king of kings and the lord of lords, the question will be asked, what did you do with my son Jesus? Did you receive him or rejected him? What did you do with the grace that I afforded you through his death 
burial, resurrection, ascension. What did you do with it? Well, if you decide to live your own life, as we talked about in this particular message today, if you decided that I can handle it, I got it, I got my own salvation, at the end of the day, when you try to save yourself by saying, you know, um, well, I was just as good as everybody else. I was just as good as those church people, you know. And man, if those church people that you, you know, if they're going to heaven, then I know I'm going because, you know, I've seen some of the things that those church people do. So what are you going to do? You're going to try to save yourself? You're going to count on your good deeds, the things that you've done. The, you know, you may have been a philanthropist and you uh, gave money to different organizations all over the world. That's trying to save yourself. You're still sowing fig leaves. When God offered the free gift, the gift of salvation, the giving of his son, John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. What are you gonna do about the cross? What are you gonna do about redemption story? Redemption story is not about an event, it is about a person who was suspended between heaven and earth for the sins of mankind. And so today, I implore you, as you just watch this message, and I pray that you receive something out of it, but I implore you, the time is getting late, and the day is at hand, the day of the Lord. The day is gonna come when God is gonna say, okay, it's enough. The age of grace is over, and now it's time for judgment. So what are you going to do, my friend? Where are you going to run? Where are you going to hide? There's no place to run and hide from God. The only hiding place that you and I have, my friend, is the cross of Jesus Christ under the shadow of his wings. I pray that you were blessed by this message. It has inspired, invoked, and provoked you to seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this message in its entirety. If you haven't listened to the first one, The Power of the Cross, please go back at this point and listen to The Power of the Cross. And then, well, you should have already listened to the one, Crucified with Christ. Remember, where there is no cross, there is no crown. And so I pray today that the Holy Spirit will seal this word in your heart and that you will share this message with others so that they too, may know the power of the cross is being crucified with Christ. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening. This is Kenneth Dentley. And as I always say, remember 1 John 4 and 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome the world because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God bless you. Until next time, Shalom.